And I wanted to begin really thinking about the way in which objects and culture in contemporary society get circulated. And for me, the, the work of the Eameses is um, a, a real um, uh, touchstone for me and, and my practice and the way that I think about the possibilities of, of art and design and technology uh, and shaping of the world. And one of the things that um, Ray and Charles did was to experiment with plywood forms uh, and to come up with new ways of shaping materials and to create uh, new forms which for, for them uh, they were looking to try to, to um, uh, create a, not just a new language um, of, of sculptural form but a language uh, that would allow them to create what um, in, in today's day and age is a whole uh, a series of, of architectural um, products which come out of a design, design background. I, I suppose for me it was um, always uh, um, a point of inspiration to think of the way that they work together as, as a team and as a, um, as, as a couple. But what they also did was that they, they moved beyond the, the fabrication of, um, uh, of, of furniture uh, and um, by the, the 1950s, by 1959, they started to move into um, a, a different kind of design. I think their, their practice as they uh, developed it um, tended not to have boundaries and um, tended to, to be exploratory and open and um, uh, coming out of, of their experience. The, the, the Eameses had a, a, a very wide practice that included uh, experimental filmmaking, uh, photography, uh, and uh, as they moved into the, the 1950s, they um, moved into exhibition design um, and they moved into um, what they started to think of as communication design uh, for, for, the information, for the information age. And a, a lot of their work um, in the, the field of experimental uh, filmmaking found its way into uh, the, these kinds of projects. Um, so Ray and, Ray and Charles Eames um, uh, were commissioned to create this particular uh, in installation as part of a, in many ways, as part of a, a Cold War propaganda exercise where um, glimpses of the, of the USA, glimpses of American life uh, were, were taken to Moscow um, in, a, in a trade fair um, context and uh, each of the, the seven screens contains images which take us through a sequence of uh, a day in the life of an American city. And in many ways, although they were uh, em employed in what is a, a, a pseudo propaganda exercise in many ways, at um, the other end of the spectrum they were also engaged in creating a whole new system for the presentation of uh, images and sounds in an environment that hadn't existed before. It's also of course worth remembering that although the, the Eameses start their lives really as uh, coming out of a traditional architecture and out of a, um, a, a modernist painting background that over the course of um, perhaps uh, 15, 20 years, they, they start to conceive their work in a, in a very different way. And they start to think of design as being um, a very different practice to what they had initially considered it. 
many of you will um, probably be aware of one of their most famous films, uh, which is called Powers of, Powers of Ten. What happens at the, the, for those of you who haven't seen the work, so we basically uh, zoom out to the outer reaches of the known universe, and then we zoom back in, uh, and then we go to the opposite end of the spectrum, and we go into the, um, the atomic level of uh, the human being. So we get this, this relationship between the outer edges of the universe and, and the most, um, and the inner universe of, of uh, the human. And the thing that I really want to mark about this work is that it's, it's, a, it's a, um, uh, a significant work in avant-garde cinema at the same time as that it's an absolutely accurate um, uh, scientific piece of, of um, visualisation. Now the Eameses, of course, they worked, they collaborated together, they were a romantic couple, um, um, they lived in a house together, they had a family, they had a studio, but in that studio they also worked with um, many other people. And it's the many other people that I think we need to be uh, aware of as we think of ourselves as artists and designers in the, the 21st century. I don't think that this is a new thing necessarily, but I think it's a, uh, the, the sort of mode that I'm trying to touch on today is really a different mode to that of the, the individual artist who works on their own, who originates every idea in their own mind and does not have to work with others. Um, there are many artists who do that and um, many artists who will continue to do that uh, for a, a long time into the future. That's fine. What I'm interested in are the practices that bring together um, really interesting outcomes, really interesting works, whether they're artworks or works of design or um, uh, whatever other kind of artefacts we might create that come out of this, the, the creative context that we, we create. Um, or the creative context that allow us to create. So making work is hard for anybody as, uh, as an individual and making work with other people um, is even harder. Um, so my next segue is really into some of my own work, but particularly work that I've produced in collaboration with others. This is a, a work that was developed by Maria Fernanda when she was living in San Francisco uh, and she was doing an artisan residency in the Exploratorium, uh, which is a museum of, of um, science and exploration. So basically that this is another post-war invention that comes at the same time as the Eameses in a sense, and it's um, the, the creation of um, Frank Oppenheimer. Uh, who responds to the, the, the horror of uh, uh, the nuclear catastrophe of the Second World War by thinking up this place of experimentation, of um, free play, of scientific and artistic invent investigation. And in, in that residency, that's where I, I first met Maria Fernanda, and, and she said, what are you working on? I said, oh, I'm working on these multi-channel videos. And I said, well, what about you? What are you working on? She said, I'm working on a flea circus. I went, oh yeah, that's um, <laughs> very interesting. She and I started to work together because we started to video the events. So um, the, the collaboration continued from, from that point and we expanded the, the show to um, a theatrical performance that ended up touring around the world. One of the things that we wanted to do with this project is to really focus on something that is so small and insignificant and give pause to a large audience to reflect upon the validity of, of that thought. So with patience, you're able to, um, to harness a flea, which is exactly what we needed to do. And then with science, we are able to um, help e explain to an audience in a very humorous and, and funny way um, exactly what the capabilities of, of uh, the fleas might be. We have to, we would have to travel with a, a flea wrangler. We had a, um, 
uh, a flea wrangler. He's probably the only flea wrangler in the world. His name is Wyman Leong, and he became part of our team, part of our troop. In fact, everywhere we went, we started developing a much larger team. We wanted to make fleas sexy because, uh, you know, they're just not. But <laughs> that was the, the idea is to make them, um, to, to challenge the, the way in which we think about these really annoying creatures. And in fact, uh, if we looked at the flea from another perspective, in fact, they're probably far um, more amazing than humans are. And so um, this really leads to uh, the next project which I want to talk about. In the, the flea circus, um, we, we focused on this um, particular aspect just for, uh, for a moment. And there was a moment where Maria Fernanda asked a, a question, a classic research question. I wonder if there are other creatures in the world that have elaborate uh, reproductive organs. Maria Fernanda started to do, in a sense, it's sort of basic research into um, uh, the understanding of uh, reproduction, not in, um, not in large creatures mostly, but in small creatures. So continued to have this focus on, on the small, to try and, and think about and, and to reveal things that are at the, the edge of human perception, or at the edge of perception that um, is unaided by, by technology. And we used our, our home as a studio to um, record and to create and to <coughs> manufacture um, a, a whole series of works which ended up being displayed in the, the Museum of Copulatory Organs on the um, Cockatoo Island. What I wanted to, to talk about a little bit here is just the, the, uh, about the, the way in which different forms of um, presentation allow us different ways to express and explore certain ideas um, in, in, its, um, in, in the various uh, plasticity, I suppose. Um, so we conceived the, the entire project as a museum, as something that would have a series of exhibits within exhibits. These, this is a, a series of uh, uh, rapid prototypes which are, um, are, are formed um, are based on the visualization of pollen. So these are the parts of, um, you know, the, the reproductive parts of, of flowers, I suppose. And what we did in order to be able to make these works is that we had to work with a, a team of um, designers and uh, creatives who could help us um, um, visualize these particular forms, reproductive organs that we're looking at here are um, microscopic. You, they're beyond the, uh, the, the naked eye. So a lot of this project, al al although it's really a continuation of pr producing this sense of wonder and awe that seems so incredibly uh, outlandish and elaborate that it could not be true, but in fact it is. But it's not so much that we're interested in, in um, creating these uh, accurate scientific models, but we're interested in, and certainly there's a very long history here, we're interested in the way in which the eyes and the hands and the minds of artists and makers, designers, can um, uh, al allow us different ways to access knowledge. And coming, coming out of this work uh, is um, uh, uh, an, another recent series called Naked Flora, uh, where we're basically taking the, the language of um, Linnaean classification of, of plants uh, by their, their reproductive um, forms and to stri strip away what you would normally see in, in um, photography of, of flowers, which are, after all, the reproductive parts of, of plants, and to, to reveal something that you haven't uh, necessarily seen or noticed before. I think that's really, the, for me, the role of, of the, the artist um, is to show something or to provoke a, a thought which hadn't been had before. So that, in a sense, um, is a, a particular collaboration between my own life partner and myself 
as well as a, a, a teams of other people who we need to work with, to collaborate with, in order to make those works possible. I thought that I would move, in, in case you think that I only work with my wife, um, <laughs> to uh, a couple of examples of other projects where I, I, I've worked with um, and, and collaborated with other artists, other designers, other thinkers, other researchers. Just worth talking a little bit about a, a project called Aviopolis, which is uh, a research project that I did in the early 2000s with Gillian Fuller. The, the, the reason why we were interested in airports is that it seemed like this um, perfect connection of the, the physical and the virtual, the networked and the actual, um, uh, and we chose that as our, as our topic for a, a piece of research which ended up um, being uh, published in a variety of forms. So we created a, a, a book that was published by Black Dog, the UK press, who do a lot of art and design books, and they weren't scared of doing an academic book that uh, contained graphics, contained um, uh, uh, photography, that contained, you know, theoretical writing. We came up with a, a team to be able to help process a lot of the material that we were um, discovering and and creating. And one of the most uh, important things for us to frame airports is this uh, concept of code. Uh, airports are coded spaces, um, that they are um, spaces that operate um, purely and simply because of the, the protocols that are embedded into real space. And so the three letter codes of airports um, demonstrate that incredibly well. We, we started to do these analyses of space and flow and uh, to represent that graphically and to try and do not just a semiotic analysis um, but to do a, a, um, a far more integrated analysis of the way in which these huge, vast, global technical systems uh, find their way into our uh, into our everyday lives and, and imbricate the world with um, certain rules, regulations and protocols. So the idea of this project was that I would um, buy a, a round the world ticket and I would just keep flying until I've done 80 airports and that I would document the, all of the, the, the GPS locations um, and document each airport by doing these walks through the airport and then uh, load up all of those images uh, into Flickr into different sets and to make them available as part of the project. And so collected all of that, um, that GPS information, collected all of the, um, the, the standard um, instrument uh, arrival chart uh, information for each of those areas and then started working with um, a, a number of programmers and um, graphic designers and modelers to try and build some models that give us a, another um, uh, understanding of what it means when we travel. What does it mean to go around the world in 80 airports? So they say that um, any one point um, in any day, there are more than two million people up in the sky. Uh, so th that was the initial idea of the Aviopolis project, is that there's a city there's a, a huge city up in the air, uh, which we called, you know, Aviopolis. So taking all of that data, and this is like pure GPS data, but connected to my own personal journeys, we started to just use um, Google SketchUp to try and um, start to visualize that space uh, a little. Um, and one of the things that we started to develop is this kind of, these really weird looking um, constructions. In airspace, it's um, very, very difficult for you to move outside of um, the designated space. Now, of course, we know that that's um, absolutely important because if, if um, we couldn't control airspace as well as we can, then you know, that's when disasters start to happen. So that work um, has now been completed as a project called Air Portals. I did want to make some more, more general comments about, about what I think all of this means. What does it mean to practice 
as an artist? What does it mean to collaborate with another person or with teams? What does it mean to mix up all of these disciplines? Um, and where does that leave us? Well, I, I think um, artists and designers are really in uh, an, an amazing period of world history, which we might call the conceptual age. Um, and I, I want to frame this firstly by, um, by, by talking about this move that I think has happened from the 20th to the 21st century. So there's this idea that has gained a, a, a bit of uh, ground over the last few years of STEM to STEAM. So STEM is uh, science, technology, engineering, maths, right? They're the bad guys. They're the ones who get all the money. They're the ones who do the hard science, sciences and so on. Um, STEM um, is really what has been responsible for the transformation of um, world culture in, in terms of technology and um, uh, the cultures that we live in of the 20th, the 20th century. However, they're missing something. And um, I mentioned this earlier, I think it's something that used to be connected with the sciences um, um, some time ago, not now. So what's missing is the A. So we're missing the, uh, the A of art. We're missing the A of art and design. Um, uh, and if we put the, the A of art into STEM, then you get STEAM. So there's this idea that, that the 21st century will be changed by the kinds of practices that we are all engaged in in our own different ways. So again, without labouring this point too much, I think what we see um, in this move from the 18th to the 21st century is a move away from the, the physical labour of humans um, to the development of mechanisation and machines and factories and assembly line practices that we know of through to this transformation that really happened in the, the mid 20th century to the information economy to knowledge workers where an understanding of, of information technology and, and science is incredibly important. I think what we've now reached is a moment where that can only take us so far and in order to differentiate anything that we do from anything else we need to um, uh, think in a bigger picture which is what artists and designers often do. We need to be able to think critically to turn things on their heads, to think out of the box and all of those cliches. We need people who can collaborate and work together in, in different ways.